My name is Peter Stevens. I'm a professor of orthopedic surgery at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. I will be presenting guided growth for sagittal correction of knee deformity. Guided growth for correction of sagittal knee plane deformities. Conservative management for crouch gait, as shown here in this girl with cerebral palsy, is ineffective. The patients end up sitting on the brace perhaps get skin sores and exert maximal effort to ambulate in these devices. Knee um, flexion deformity typically is often addressed with extension supracondylar femoral osteotomy with or without patellar advancement, hamstring lengthening, and multiple level surgery, popularly termed as single event multi-level surgery. However, this has certain problems associated, as shown here. The level of correction is not at the level of deformity, so you have to create a compensatory deformity in the distal femur. Fixation is compromised by the nearby physis, and remodeling produces recurrence of the flexion gait, requiring further surgery. In this particular patient, there's frontal plane deformity of iatrogenic varus on the right and valgus on the left as well as limb length inequality. So the osteotomies come with significant problems downstream. Furthermore, if you um, just study hamstring lengthening and multiple level surgery, the long-term results can be disappointing as this article in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery with pelvic tilt, recurve bottom, and deterioration of long-term outcome. The concept of guided growth is to try to avoid this series of problems and have a less invasive treatment for the patient. I should emphasize that this is not a growth arrest. In fact, the patients gain considerable height as a result of straightening the fixed flexion deformity. This model shows the medial and lateral sides that the plates are, although they are intrasynovial, they're non-articular. It's important that you avoid the sulcus and the articular cartilage and the patella to place these. The technique is quite simple. The image intensifier is placed in the horizontal position with the knee over a flexed bolster. The physis is identified, as you see on the top left, inserting a guide needle, followed by the plate and the guide pins, followed by the cannulated screws. The circle on the bottom is to remind you not to use the longest screw. This is a 32 millimeter screw but with the femur growing distally, it may become prominent through the cortex later. So 24 millimeter screws are sufficient. This is a comparison over 16 months of a patient who hit his growth spurt at just the right time and had considerable straightening with this minimally invasive outpatient procedure. Note that he still has patella alta. It is unnecessary to transfer the patella until you achieve correction of the fixed flexion deformity and then make that decision. We have documented in the gait laboratory the normalization of the knee. The green is postoperative compared to the blue pre-op. So the knee kinematics are normalized, which is not surprising as the fixed deformity is corrected. What is also interesting is that there are remote benefits at the pelvis, hip, and ankle as well. So I refer to this as single level multi-event surgery. This girl uh, had a different problem. She was jumping on a trampoline and sustained a fracture of her proximal left tibial epiphysis, a Salter II type injury that was reduced and treated with a cast. You can see on this full length view that it looks like her clear space of the knee is diminished and she may have an intraarticular injury. I remind you this is a projectional artifact because on the lateral view, you can see that her posterior proximal tibial angle, which should be 81 degrees, is 105 degrees. So it's 24 degrees uh, tilted forward relative to the normal side. This for her is like walking without a posterior cruciate ligament and a sense of knee instability and difficulty running. And typically would require an osteotomy of the proximal tibia and fibula in a very high risk area for compartment syndrome and complications. Instead, I chose the option of guided growth. This is through a midline posterior incision. I would not feel comfortable placing a staple in that location, which could come loose, but a plate will not loosen. Over time, she maintained excellent range of motion and gradual correction. 16 months later, you can see the divergence of the screws 
Note that it's fine to mix the length of the screws. That's the surgeon's choice. And uh, the opposite knee is shown for comparison. So now her left knee is slightly straighter than her, her uh, normal right knee with hyperextension. You can see the midline scar posteriorly. She's a gymnast. She's returned to all activities following a minor outpatient procedure. And uh, shortly after that other film, the metaphyseal screw was removed percutaneously under fluoroscopic guidance, knowing that uh, she has several more years to grow. And with the remote chance that she has recurrent recurvatum, the screw could be reinserted percutaneously. So in summary, I've shown two cases to illustrate that sagittal guided growth works very well and is safe. With respect to fixed knee flexion deformity and cerebral palsy and other conditions, there are remote benefits at the hip and ankle as well, and you may obviate the need for osteotomy. Thank you.